Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to share with you some of the features that I absolutely love in Logic Pro and that have changed the way I work and hopefully they can help you and they can help you speed up your workflow and get better results from this great program. If there is a feature that you already know, then fine. There are chapters here. Flick onto the ones you don't because they'll be well worth your viewing time. And if you're wondering why my eye is like this, then check this video because it will tell you what happened. So now that we've identified the elephant in the room, please could you like, subscribe, and press the bell for future content to help support my channel. Thank you. The first tip I'm gonna start with today are called arrangement markers. These markers will allow you to be able to rearrange your track really quickly, including all your automation, even your bus automation. As long as it's in your arrangement, it will move everything and it will cut everything really clean and very quickly. Let me show you. So normally if I wanted to add another eight bars after this loop here, in between this section and that section, I probably would do something like this. Chop it, go back to eight bars, say yes, move it all, highlight all of this, and then copy it across, drop it in there, and say copy, and then hope that that all would work. I say hope that would work because the bigger the arrangement, the more likely you are that you're gonna either not see something or not highlight it or not copy it across, or you might have an empty channel. So for instance here, I've got a reverb bus and that reverb bus has got automation in that verse, but I've now added a verse. So really I need to move that same automation across again so that it pushes the rest of the automation with the track like how it should be. Well, in this particular case, it hasn't. So that chorus automation that should sit here is actually now sitting here because I've not moved it across. So there's ways around that, but I'm not going to confuse the issue here. This, all these problems get avoided if you use arrangement markers. First, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to global tracks up here and we're gonna try and find something that's got arrangement. If yours doesn't say arrangement in there, you can do control and click and get arrangement in there like that, or right click and that brings you to that little drop down menu anyway. So I'm gonna remove the others because we don't need them just for confusion, just take them out. And then I'm going to enlarge that so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, first I'm gonna put the markers in and lay out the track. So first we're gonna put that there and I'm gonna call that um, uh, rename silence, click another one, and each marker that it creates is eight bars, so this is a pretty quick process. So once we've done that, that now means that all those are connected to the regions that are down below. So if I was to say, okay, well, I want another pre-chorus from here, holding down option, I could then say, well, I want another pre-chorus just before this chorus here. Boom, that's it, done. And it's copied straight away, it's copied all the automation, it copies across the bus automation as well, it kicks everything along quite easily. If I said, you know what, I actually don't want that section, you delete it. If you don't want to write anything else in there and completely delete it, you can just delete that out there. Or if you said, you know, I don't want a double verse here, delete that, it takes out the content, and then you can either copy a new one manually in here, you could say, well, you know what, I want the first half of that in there instead, you can still do all of that. Or you say, no, I totally want to remove it, and you totally remove it. And then finally, if there were any changes you wanted to do here, but you wouldn't want that to affect your regions down below, you can click on arrangements and say suspend content connection, which basically means that these markers are not connected to your regions. But I don't see a reason why you would need to, because if you wanted to move any boxes, you do that anyway, and they don't affect your markers at all. If you ask me what my favorite feature of Logic Pro was, that's probably it. It makes arrangements so fast and so seamless. I use it all the time. And the great thing is you can do this right at the end of a mix. Sometimes when you copy it, you do have to move some of the transition points and have to have a look at those, but that's minor work compared to such a big, big edit that you can do so quickly. This next one is importing another Logic project and then being able to take stuff from it that you need in your current project. What you do is you go to File and you go to Import and you go to Logic Projects. And what that does is it will then ask you which project do you want to import? So you say, okay, well this one, I did this last year, August, I think, and then bam, that is then that Logic project that you're then looking at. So you can then say, okay, well, you know, I just wanna look at 
uh, the instruments that I had. So those are all the instruments that you had. So say I now say, well, you know what? I, I really love that muted bass sound that I had in there. So what I want from that is I want the content. So you click content and you might say, well, I want from that as well. I want the plugins from that. Uh, and then, yeah, you might want some automation from it or something. And then you say, okay, we'll add that. And then that imports that part directly into your current arrangement. You can then edit that and that will all be exactly as it was and it will bring it in. It will even bring in the level of the volume. It will bring in any panning that you had or it will even bring in what bus you had. Or you could say, well, I want the auxiliary. I really love the way I had my um, reverb lined up on the auxiliary channel. You could then say, well, I want the I want the plugin, say, for instance, I don't want the in and out on this. I just want the channel in there. And then you go add. And that has then added that into my environment right here. And that is then that bus. So you can then assign other things to that bus and get the same reverb effect as you did on that particular track. And that brings us on to number three. This is FlexTime Audio Quantize and it allows you to quantize your audio files. This is especially useful for live instrumentation that you've recorded, say, a bass or a guitar, but you can also use it on your loops, like your drum loops. If you get a hip hop loop that's quite loose, but you want it to sit tight, then you can just apply this function and get it to sit tight with your project. Let me show you. <laughs> For those guitar players out there, I intentionally play that out of time, of course, of course. Yes, definitely ropey. So with the region highlighted, we go over to Flex, we go Flex Rhythmic, we let it analyze, and then once it's analyzed, we can then go up to Quantize in here and say, right, 16th. So you can clearly hear that let's put it bang in time. If anything, it's a little bit too bang in time compared to the track. So just delay it a little bit. If you double click on the file or press E and then click on show or hide flex time, it will show you exactly where each one of those transients has been pushed into the time onto the beat. The art of recording into a DAW is to make sure that things don't sound clinical and don't sound too tight because you want it to sound real. So when we're putting this guitar onto my track, you can see that certain bits still sound out. And that will happen because I move my instrumentation around so that things start to sound real and alive. So I would still have to go in manually and just adjust certain timings of that guitar to sit tight, but at least it puts most of it roughly where it needs to be. And then we can and just adjust it as we need to. And now on to the next one. And this one is track stacks. There's two types of track stacks, summing stack and a folder stack. First, we'll look at a folder stack. Say for instance, I've got my beats. If I right click on that or control click, if you then go to create stacks and you go to folder and then say create, then what it does is it puts all of those beats into a folder, which then allows you to control the mute, the solo and the volume of those tracks as a group all together. But you can still go in and go in and adjust your own levels internally, but you have an overall control over all of them. And then there's the summing stack, which in principle works the same. So you put your instruments together and you say, right, okay, I've got these two here, but what I'm gonna do for the example is I'm gonna add a new instrument just quickly, and I'm just gonna select anything from over here, maybe get a piano. Um, and then what you can then do is you can then select those three instruments, say, and right click or control click on that if you haven't got a right click, create a track stack, select summing, then that summing track again looks the same as the folder stack and you can mute solo and control the volume of those instruments at the same time. But with summing stack, you can play the instruments inside the stack all at the same time from your MIDI keyboard, like this. So as you can see, track stacks, very easy to set up, very useful. It cleans up your arrangement very quickly. You can almost create like a patch and play MIDI to five or six instruments all at the same time. 
very handy and also the beauty is is that if you have got automation on those channels that are in the track stack the track stack will still control their overall volume so it's another way of controlling channels regardless of what you're doing with the automation on those channels and now we have number five this is converting audio melodies into midi notes so this one really works for people that don't really play keyboards or can't find their notes quickly on a keyboard and then might lose the idea that they've got so what you can do is you can quickly record a melody with your vocal and then convert that into MIDI. So first what you do is you set up a recording channel that you can record onto, you set your microphone up, you go into record and you record your melody. So if that's your melody and you're happy with that, something really silly, I know, but just bear with me. You select the file, you go to flex mode on the left, you select flex pitch, you let it analyze, and then you press E. And then as you can see, it's created a melody along with all the notes I've done. So I don't think I've sung it very well. <laughs> then you go to edit and you select create MIDI track from flex pitch data and then it will create the melody here. So we mute the audio channel. Okay, so as you can see, some notes sometimes come out a little bit funky, but you can just adjust them, but most of it you capture, and especially if you sing a bit better, then that's great. You can use your guitar. If you play a guitar and you don't really know how to play keyboards, you can convert them. Remember, it only does solo notes, so it won't do chords, but if you know the notes of the chord and you really wanted to do chords as well, you could individually play each note and then convert them all one by one and join them back up. That is an option for you. Next up is number six, and this is about the freeze function. This is especially helpful for those of you that have computers that aren't as fast, but are still trying to do a lot with them. I used to do it all the time when I had a really slow laptop years and years ago, and I used to use the freeze function all the time, and it allowed me to do a lot more than what you would normally expect to get out of your computer. So this is how you do that. You would have probably worked out the telltale signs of when your computer gets tired because it will come up to a chorus where there's usually more instrumentation and processing and all of a sudden it just comes up to it and it stops and it says it can't keep up or it can't manage to process all the data. So what you need to do first is just go to your transport bar and go to custom. Then go over to up here where it says CPU, double click on that and then that will show you what your power is like and what your power is being used at. So if I play, you can see this is minimal, it's absolute, I mean, it's a basic track at the moment, so, you know, it's got no processing. But if this was, if this processing was coming above 75 on all of them, you would start seeing problems. So you would start seeing this track um, stopping, it wouldn't play properly, you, you couldn't loop it probably, so all these things. So keep an eye on this performance meter, you can always pull it out and put it to the corner of your arrangement or something like that. So to set your arrangement up for freezing, if you right click on one of your channels or use command and click and go to track header components and then click on freeze, you will see that there is a snowflake beside each channel. What you would then do is press X and go to your mixer and you would find out which plugins you are using that are probably going to be the heaviest plugins or the most juicy, I would call them plugins. And then you say, right, so that's on that channel, that channel, that channel and that channel. And then what you would do is you would click on freeze and then you press play. And then as you press play, what it will then do is it will then go and bounce all those channels down from start to end. When it's finished, you can press command and full stop. And then you will notice that now you don't have access to them anymore, but the track will still play the same. So it basically bounces down all those files and it doesn't use any processing for any of those plugins. And that brings us to number seven, which is the Logic Remote. This one's quite self-explanatory. You can download the Logic Remote from the App Store. It works on a garage band as well as Logic, and it works on your iPad or your iPhone. It allows you to record, change volume, cycle sections. The great thing with this app is, is you can basically do your own vocals, and you don't have to be right by your screen to do that or your computer to do that. Your computer might be a bit noisy, the fan might be going, 
or you have your microphone stand set up over there because you've got a certain deadness in the room there or you've got like a bit of an isolation area where you do your vocals, well, you can just use that app just to press record and really get into that take. So you don't have to keep walking back and forward. Really great addition. It will come in handy at some stage and you can just download it for free. And now tip number eight, how you can quickly copy your channel strip settings from one channel to the other. Very useful. Say you've been working on this here and it's a snare at the moment, but say it's a vocal and you've really created a really nice EQ. I've just added these on just for us to work with and you're really, really happy with that and now you wanna copy that onto another channel. Well, you could do that by going in here and save it as a channel strip, then go to the new channel and load up the channel strip and then it's there. But there is a quicker way and the quicker way is by basically doing option command C and then going to the channel where you want to go and do option command V. And that basically instantly copies all those plugins exactly the same, including the bus, onto that channel. Just be aware, though, that if you want to copy the effects from an audio track to any other track, it's not a problem. But if you want to copy the effects plugins from an instrument track and then paste it onto your new instrument track, you will copy everything, including the instrument, which means that you might overwrite the instrument that you already have on that instrument track that you're pasting it to. And that brings us on to tip number nine. And this one's one that not many people seem to either use or want to use or don't even know about it. So it is basically setting up your right click to also be a tool. Let me show you. So we all know about the left click, which is this one here, which if we want something else for that, we can select that. We know about this command tool, which you can again assign. And then by pressing command, that gives you that tool straight away, which is very handy. But then if we press command and comma, go into preferences and select general and then go into editing and then go down to where it says right mouse button, we can now also set that as is assignable as tool. That then means that we now have a third tool that we can do instantly without having to change any settings. So I like having that one on the scissor tool. And then the middle one, I tend to uh, toggle between curve tool and a couple of other tools, but let's put it on curve tool for now. So the right click now allows me to chop any file quite easily. And then if I go to, uh, down to automation, if I then wanted to set a couple of automation points and put a curve on it, I can hold command down and do that instantly without having to mess around and go up here, change it and whatever, whatever. The only thing you've got to remember is that usually when you press right click on a region, you used to get that menu box, which you now don't. But all you've got to do is just press control and click and you'll have that same function available. So any right click functions that you were using, you now just do control and click and you get exactly the same menu. And then that brings us to number 10, which is the last one in this video. And this one is how to zoom in on regions and how quickly and how efficiently we can zoom in onto them. So the first option is very simple. Select the region and press Z. And that brings you in right really close to that file. Press Z again and it'll take you out. If you want four of files, you press Z and it brings you into all four files and press Z again and you're out. So that's the first function. And the second option is drawing a box around something. So if you press option and go around something like that, then that will be the size it will be in the screen. And the box is the screen. So it's exactly that size. And then to come out of that, you press control and option and it will click outside. I actually always press control and option, but you don't have to, but I just get used to just control and option is zoom in, zoom out. The beauty of this is, is that you can zoom a larger amount. You can zoom it again. You can zoom in again. You can zoom in again until you get really small and you're happy with making that edit. And then by pressing option and control again and clicking once back, you go back one of the zooms you did and click again and you go back another zoom that you did and go back again and go back again and go back again until you're back where you were. Out of those two, for me, the second one is by far the best. It's really controllable, it's very fast, and you can get to really fine zooms, cut, do your edits, and come back out really quickly. It's a much faster way to edit, and you'll get around logic so much more quickly if you start using it. 
And that brings me to the end of this video. It's quite a long one today, and there's a lot of information to absorb here. I would suggest repeating the parts that you're not sure on. DM me or message me anything that you feel that you're not sure on and that you like more clarification on, and then I will explain that to you directly. That's not a problem. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'm sure you must have learned something in this one. Uh, please like, subscribe, and ring the bell for future content. I always ask this. It's a bit of a tick box exercise, I know, but I really appreciate it if you could support my channel so that I can keep doing these videos for you. And I hope you've learned something that will make you quicker and be more efficient in what you're doing. Have a great day. Goodbye.